Good morning. morning. Good to be with you on this day, especially grateful for the folks who put our lectionary together. So you know our readings um, in the church here follow various things, uh, and when it's Advent, we're preparing for Jesus coming, Christmas season, you get the idea, Lent, Easter. During the summer, for us, the Pentecost season, you notice it's the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. That means a lot to you all, right? So in the Pentecost season, the folks that set up our lectionary thousands of years ago wanted to relate the Old Testament and New Testament lesson at very, excuse me, the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel reading at various times. And while at the same time you're reading through the epistles. I don't know if you noticed that. But this morning is very important because not only did whoever came up with our lectionary for today, again, uh, church leaders thousands of years ago, but Jesus wants us to read these two things together. He wants us to think about Isaiah 5 because the people he was speaking to in the gospel reading today knew Isaiah 5. So first, guess what we're going to do? Ah, yay, interactive church. That is fun. Okay, yeah, so Isaiah 5. Uh, You don't have Bibles in front of you. I know this because I stole this from the giant stack of Bibles back there. So trust me or pull it up on your phone. Don't pretend to text. Um... In Isaiah 5, the point is pretty clear, bear fruit, right? And it's a lesson for Israel. And so if you think through a lot of Old Testament teachings, a lot of it has to do with Israel be faithful lest you... And in this case, you're not going to be part of the blessings of the Lord. And so Israel, this little nation that God chose, is going to be cast out. So when you read into the gospel lesson for today, you have to have that in mind first. That the vineyard is to bear fruit. That the Lord who's caring for the vineyard is bearing fruit. The Lord who brings in workers, the nation of Israel, it's to bear fruit. And if you don't... But Jesus changes the lesson. He takes that original story and alters it a little bit. Let's see why. Okay, so uh, Matthew 21. What's the first thing that happens in Matthew 21? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with Holy Week. Matthew 21. It's fine. I have have the cheat sheet in front of me, so it's okay. Um, It's a triumphal entry. So Palm Sunday just happened, okay? So I want you to think about Holy Week for a second. So Palm Sunday happens. All the crowds are there. Hosanna, hey, Zanna, 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 Hosanna, hey, Zanna. Oh, that's from a Jesus Christ Superstar. Anyway, you get the idea. So Jesus comes in, but it doesn't stop there. So it doesn't go from yay to cross. There's events that happen. And Matthew lays, uh, spends a lot of chapters letting out what happens that week. So Jesus first cleanses the temple. Okay, so he comes in, he's riding, he's peaceful. But then he goes to the temple and throws the tables over. Remember that? So the leaders are already wigging out because that's their financial system. They already know Jesus is a troublemaker. We know this from, uh, from the other gospel readings that happened before this. So the leaders are already nervous. The crowds have gathered and they're all celebrating them. Jesus is causing turmoil on the financial systems for the temple. And then Jesus kills a fig tree. That's its own crazy thing that happens. But then Jesus goes into the temple to teach. His disciples aren't necessarily with him. And if you recall, whenever we are reading scripture in this way, so, so the prose of the gospel, the Holy Spirit's inviting us to step into the story. Don't just observe from here, observe in place. The problem is, when gospel readings like this happen, we are stuck with the perspective of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the leaders. So we have to read this story in their place. And we'll talk about why in a moment. So in verse 23, when Jesus enters the temple, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the leaders of the temple are already like, okay, what authority do you have to be doing all this stuff? A lot of them have been waiting to ask him this before. Many have asked him before in synagogues. But now they're like, Jesus, who, who are you and what authority do you have? And Jesus tells some parables and some lessons. And this is part of him answering that story. So who are you is really at the root of this story. I want us to have that in mind as well. So then Jesus tells them this other parable. 
There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug up a wine press, and put a tower. Now, that initial sentence made the Pharisees and the other leaders the, uh, that were there immediately go to, to Isaiah 5. So, the, the, created the, the vineyard, built a fence, built a tower, built the wine press. They know. Okay, so Jesus is going to tell some a retelling of Isaiah 5 about bearing bad fruit? No. But he wants them in that scenario. So when the season of the fruit are near, servants, tenants, etc., you notice there's nothing in this about bearing bad fruit. Now, that is still true. Isaiah 5 is still the lesson that we must bear fruit. You know this. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is... I never get it right, but I know that love and love, pairs, pairs, pair and kindness, right? All that stuff is good and right. But that's not where he goes with this. He goes a different direction. So the vineyard, the world, just to cheat a little bit and let you know what the parable is actually relating to, the vineyard is the world. And when I say world, I don't mean the ground. That's earth. World is people. So he's referring to the people are bearing fruit. The world is good. It's doing things. Yay. And he has appointed people to take care of the world. Okay? Now, we can skip to the end of the reading and know that the people who are taking care of the world, meaning taking care of the vineyard, are the Pharisees and Sadducees. But let's translate that even further. It's us. It's the religious leaders. But that's not it. Now... Uh, to be honest, if we were a Catholic church, and I, I'm, I'm half Italian, so I went to Catholic church half my life, this parable would refer only to the priests. The problem is, sorry, this parable isn't just about us up here. Because what Luther reminded us is it's not just about us. That when the kingdom came, and where's your baptismal font? Baptismal font the back. Uh, when you were baptized, you became part of the priesthood of all believers. And so what Jesus is telling us is that we are the ones who have been put in charge of this vineyard, the world. We're the ones who are to care for it, the Christians, the church on earth, his kingdom coming. So now put your feet firmly in the hearers of this parable. When the season for the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get fruit. The tenants took his servants and killed them. Then they killed another, and he sent more, and they killed them. And then he sent his son. Now, immediately, we, are, we know where he's going with this, but I want you to remember the frame of the story. What was the original question from the Pharisees and Sadducees? What are they asking Jesus? Who are you? Well, that makes this even a bigger deal. Jesus says, I'm the son who has now come into the world to meet with the people I chose to care for the world to receive the good of the world, the good fruit. And what do they do with him? One of the many times Jesus points to later that week, he's pointing to Good Friday. A few days later, he's going to be killed. Now, they by this time have figured out that he's talking to them, right? But they only have one way of answering this question that Jesus poses. So, uh, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? So, when the Father calls you to table, you people in charge of this vineyard who have killed my servants, have now killed my son, what do you think that father is going to do? The owner of the vineyard, the father to the son. And they have no choice but to say, oh, he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death. The Greek word there is more fun, but miserable death. And let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him fruit of the season. But it's that last line that gives us a little bit more insight into what's going on. That last line there. And let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. The problem with the story, the, the parable Jesus tells, is not that the vineyard didn't bear fruit. Okay? 
The problem is that the people in charge of the vineyard are preventing the fruit from getting to the owner. So in this case, the Pharisees and Sadducees are standing in the way of the goodness of God's people, Israel, and God. They're in the way. Now, I, I got to admit, we, we, we often kind of come down on the Pharisees and Sadducees because, you know, they don't do so well in Scripture. And so you immediately think, well, they're wicked. The Pharisees and Sadducees are terrible people. They're only worried about their own stuff. One half of them is worried about political power. The other people are worried about religious power. Okay. But that's not really true. Remember, these are religious leaders who actually devote their lives to service of what they think is good and right. But they've gone off, and Jesus is trying to steer them back. So they get in the way. Now we're in their shoes, so what is Jesus saying to us? We get in the way. We get in the way of connecting the world to Jesus. When we act in the, in the context of this parable, the problem is, we are not proclaiming Christ to the vineyard, and we're not allowing Christ to receive the good fruit of his vineyard. What does this mean? Well, I'm not saying that we flat out reject Jesus or somehow hiding this great gift that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't think that's true. I don't think any of you, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, I don't think any of you are, are evil to your core. Like, oh, I know the gospel, but I'm not going to tell anybody. No, it's we often get focused on the wrong things. And that our work in this vineyard, in the world, our work in the world as caretakers of the world, his chosen people, the church, Often we're looking at different things. We're paying attention to the wrong things. We're getting caught up so that we're not proclaiming the truth. Here, here's one example. When we think that it's our vineyard and not his, or maybe say it this way, when we think it's our church, not theirs, not his. Now, I know many of you are probably members here for a long time. You love this place. But this is kind of a question you already know the answer to. Is this your church? No. And we're, we're bad at this too. Because we'll say, yeah, how's your church doing? Well, I mean, I know what we're getting at. But it does hint at something. This isn't ours. It's his. We're caretakers of the great gift of the gospel to bring to the world. And there's another thing about this. If we don't lead with the gospel, if we're not bearing the fruit in the world and bringing it to the Lord, that means sometimes we're distracted and doing other things. Here's some nuance in this. I know, basically because I've read the survey that all of you talking about your church and stuff, that you guys love Christian education. You love that Mountain View is here and kids are learning about Jesus. You love that there's kids in the service that you invest time for a children's chat. But it's not just about educating children during the day, is it? It's about proclaiming the gospel so that they grow in truth. I know that you all love fellowship events. You love being around each other. You love caring for each other. But that's still secondary to the proclamation of the gospel. I know that you want to care for all of the homeless people around this church and in the city of Las Vegas that no one would sleep on the street. That is even secondary to the proclamation of the gospel. It's not wrong. It's not bad. But it has to flow out of our proclamation of the gospel, of letting people know who Jesus is, and that at the very center of everything we do, is this good news of Jesus. That we as good tenants of this great vineyard are people who connect the vineyard to its owner, connecting people to Jesus. 
You notice in the middle of this, Jesus quotes something you've heard before. Jesus said to them, have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. We read this during the Kyrie. This was the Lord's doing, it was marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting Psalm 118, okay? Now, we know this because Jesus is the cornerstone, but he takes it deeper. He says, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who aren't producing, so the one who falls on the stone will be broken when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. What's he saying there? He's saying to us, when we lose focus, yeah, we will be destroyed. We will be kicked out. The cornerstone, Jesus, will put us out. We will no longer be inheritors of the kingdom. We are no longer part of the rule and reign of God. However, this is that great however that comes through Easter. The cornerstone that was rejected. He starts that little section by saying, have you never read in the scriptures? What it really says there in the Greek is, have you ever really ingested this verse? Have you ever really understood it? Remember, he's talking to these leaders in the temple, people who are teachers of the law and the prophets. And so have you, do you really understand what this means? Now we know, we get the cheat sheet of Easter, that the cornerstone which was rejected, Jesus, has been made the cornerstone. That the stone that was rejected, us, you and me, through our baptisms, have been made right and true and good. But let's put it back into the parable. That we who threw out the son and killed him, that we who sin and reject the love and truth of the kingdom in Jesus Christ, have been brought back by that same son and have been made true and right and good. And that now, you are the cornerstone. You are the foundation in the world. You, the church, is the good caretakers of the vineyard, to say it in parable terms. But I'll say it in flat, normal terms. You have been chosen to be the ones through whom the Lord loves the world. You have been chosen to be the ones who proclaim the life-saving gospel to the world. You. This is how the Lord has set it up. So let's think about the parable in the way the Lord wants to tell it. The Father set up this wonderful, wonderful vineyard. And he hired out a bunch of people to care for it. You're those people. And that on the last day, when it's time for the fruits to be brought to bear, the Father returns, Jesus Christ in the clouds, the trumpets sound, and we, with joy in our hearts and billions of people around us, can say, Lord, we are your tenants of this world, and here is the fruit of our labor. That all people know you, that all people are freed from sin and death because of the work you've done through us. We have to be joyful in that work. We have to actually thank the Lord that even though we rejected, he came back and made it right. And so here and now, let's proclaim Jesus. Let's spend every day, every breath, every moment proclaiming Jesus and freeing this world of sin and death. May it be the center of our ministries here at First Good Shepherd. And may it be at the center of your lives when you leave this place. For the sake of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.